as strength coaches, we all understand that it's really about the consistency, the, the consistent nature of training of doing anything is really how you gain adaptation. And really what we try to help our players do is avoid the, the big swings, the big highs and the, yeah. and the low lows and try to find a level of consistency. Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I'll be joining the line later today by Jimmy Stitz from the USA Women's National Volleyball Team. Man, that's a mouthful. But I want to give you a quick recap of the week that was, talk a little bit about my favorite moment from this week's show. But man, lots going on in my neck of the woods right now. Kids are currently finishing up their winter sports. About two weeks left, I believe, of indoor soccer. So Cade, for once, played like a normal (laughs) co-ed team like they're supposed to in this league. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it in last week's episode, but I think last week they literally played like the U8 national team. (laughs) They got beat about 20 or 25 to nothing. So that was not a great experience. So they actually played a co-ed team this week and they actually got a win. So that was really fun for them. Uh, Kendall took a loss, but man, they played the best team in the league and they played them really tough. And I think... The coolest thing about that was that girl was tired. She had a friend spend the night here on Friday. She went to a different friend's house Saturday, which, you know, a sleepover at this age is rare. But the fact that she had two on the same weekend was incredibly rare. But man, she was just really, really dominant in the game. And maybe not so much in the sense that, you know, being on the ball and doing all that. But man, she just ran and worked so hard. I knew she was tired kept egging her on. Man, she played so hard. I was so proud of her. I told her, you know, in 10 years, probably, you know, only a handful of times I've been more proud of that girl because she brought her A game effort. And then we had to have the discussion because after the game, you know, I'm congratulating her. The other parents, the coaches are all, oh, Kendall, great effort. So proud of you. And, uh, She's like, just so you know, I'm not going to play quite that hard every week. And I was like, whatever. Yeah, you are, girl. Like, that's how you play the game. That's how you honor and respect the game by giving it your best effort every day. So we'll see if we can kind of stuff that in a bottle and bring it every week. But definitely very proud of her there. So full sports weekend. On top of that, I had a handful of my NBA guys back. They had a very short five-day, six-day break. For the NBA All-Star break, but I had a couple of them in over the break, so it was great to catch up with them, make sure their bodies are tuned up and ready to hit this next stretch because, man, the next two, two and a half months are going to be really intense for these guys. So lots of travel, lots of back-to-backs, but I'm excited to see where they're at because their bodies look good. I think we did a good job of freshening them up, getting all the, the right muscles turned back on. So excited for them. Complete coach cert launch this week. Uh, I do that biannually. So every March and September run a insider's list and a public launch. So excited to push that back out there, man. The the big thing this time around was getting NSCA CEUs, especially in the current climate. It's very hard to get CEUs. You're not going to courses. You're not doing live workshops. So, you know, I feel like the fact that we got 2.0 NSCA CEUs, which is the equivalent of an entire year of Con Ed is a pretty big deal. So I'm excited to get that out there. And as excited as I am about getting it out there and getting it in the hands of more people, also excited about the future of that and just thinking about, okay, like every time I've relaunched, I've added a little something, taking it to the next level in some small way. So just thinking about what's next, man, what am I going to do for this September launch? Because it's my goal to try and make this industry the best possible place it can be. I don't claim to be perfect, but 21 years of of wins and losses tends to teach you a lot. So hopefully the people that invest in that course are using it and they're getting better results uh, by using it. So that's what's new in my neck of the woods. Uh, Before we jump into the show with Jimmy, if you've listened to this show for for more than, you know, a handful of episodes, you know, I'm always kind of dabbling and changing up this intro because I never want it to get stale. I never want it to feel like it's just Mike rambling about you know, whatever is going on. So today and in the upcoming weeks, I want to talk about one moment in the show that really stands out to me and give you my perspective on it. So when you listen to this episode with Jimmy, one of the things that he talks about and that was so important to his development was finding the right mentor at a young age. And it makes me think a lot about when I was coming up in this industry, 
kind of at the the really the start of the internet. So I had access to coaches like Charles Poliquin, like Ian King, that I would have had no business being in a room with or learning from at that point in time. Uh, but having access to those guys really helped shape and mold who I was as a coach. Because let's be frank, I didn't have the in-person mentors in my 20s that I would have hoped for. You know, it wasn't until I met Bill, I think I was 27 at the time when we finally crossed paths that I finally felt like, okay, now I have a real mentor. And granted, it's not this woe is me thing. When I was uh, in graduate school, Dr. Newton was amazing. Dr. Kramer was amazing. I learned a ton from those guys, but it's a different relationship because they have to supervise and oversee so many people. Whereas with Bill, I felt very much like, hey man, I'm one of a few people that he's working with, that he's guiding. And so if you are listening to this, and I don't care if you're in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, if you wanna continue to grow and evolve in this industry, you need to find a mentor. And really there's no reason not to have one now. I mean, they're so accessible. If you can't find somebody locally that can help groom you and teach you how to, to think more critically, to you know, get better results with the clients, the athletes, uh, the patients, if you're in a rehab setting, if you can't find people to shape and guide you in person, I mean, there's this amazing thing called the internet now. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've mentored people from, you know, the US, from the UK, from Australia. I mean, Bill, he's got days where literally he's like, oh yeah, six was Germany, seven was Ireland, eight was Great Britain. Like, <laughs> It's amazing. So my point to you is this, if you are struggling, find a mentor. If you're not where you want to be personally, professionally, find a mentor. Jimmy talks about it in this show. He wouldn't be where he's at if he didn't find a mentor early on in his career. And you don't have to do it early, right? I mean, 27 for me, there are people in their 30s and 40s that are just now finding mentors because they know they can help them continue to grow and evolve both personally and professionally. So that's my pitch for today, my friend. We're going to take a quick break. Then we're going to jump into this awesome show with Jimmy. I really think you're going to love it. One thing Bill Hartman and I have talked about for years now is the power of mentorship. Early on, I didn't have a mentor to shape or guide me, or most importantly, help me find the blind spots in my own training and coaching. But luckily, after many years of trial and error, I found Bill and my professional success exploded as a result. But the downside to the mentorship process, at least professionally, is that it can be pricey. For private mentees that I work with, it costs anywhere from $3.99 to $5.99 per month to work together. And while I know the results go far beyond that price, the fact of the matter is that just won't work for a lot of folks. So when Bill and I sat down a while back, we asked ourselves a really tough question. How can we help shape the future of the industry and truly make it great? And beyond that, how can we create amazing content yet make it affordable to virtually every trainer or coach out there? And the answer for us was simple, restart iFast University. Here's what you'll get when you become a member of iFast University. One update each month from myself and Bill. This could cover anything from improving exercise technique to writing better programs and everything in between. Twice per month Q and A's, where Bill and I will personally answer your questions to help you become better at training, coaching, or even running your fitness business. A Facebook group where you'll be surrounded by like-minded trainers and coaches who are serious about getting better, and access to the iFastU archives, where you'll be able to watch literally hundreds of pieces of content from the iFast team over the years. This blend of content and Q&A is specifically designed to help make you the best trainer or coach possible. If you're interested in learning more, head on over to iFastUniversity.com to get signed on. We'd love to have you on board. Jimmy Stitz joined the U.S. Women's National Volleyball Team staff full-time in the spring of 2015, following a year with the program as a seasonal assistant strength and conditioning coach through the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee Mentorship Program. Prior to joining the staff, Jimmy worked as an intern at the former Olympic Training Center in Chula Vista, California. Additionally, he was selected from a pool of national candidates to serve as an assistant coach through the National Strength and Conditioning Association Assistantship Program in 2013. 
In this show, Jimmy and I explore the world of professional and Olympic level volleyball, but we start by talking about the need and role of a mentor first. From there, we talk about the differences between managing and developing high level athletes, why the power to weight ratio is such a key factor for success in volleyball, and why he's put such a premium on building durable, adaptable, and robust athletes. This was a fantastic interview, and I really think you're gonna enjoy it. But enough for me, let's do this. Jimmy, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to have you on. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Pleasure to be here, first of all. Thanks for having me. Jimmy Stitz, I'm the athletic performance coach for USA Volleyball's women's senior national team. Born and raised in Minnesota. I live in Long Beach, California with my wife, and uh, we're expecting our first child any day here. That's exciting, man. That's exciting. You definitely upgraded on geography too, man. Minnesota to Cali, that doesn't suck. Oh, no, not at all. Absolutely <laughs> not. And I've lost whatever whatever Minnesota cold credibility that I, I had, I no longer have. It's 60 <laughs> degrees here and I'm bundled up like it's below zero in Minnesota. So That's I've awesome. lost whatever credibility there is there. I love it, man. Well, talk to me. What led you to the world of physical preparation? How did you get started in all this? Yeah, you know what? Like I'm sure everybody who's been on your program and anyone who's in the uh, sport performance world, we all were athletes growing up and that was kind of uh, a large part of our lives. And uh, I was no different than I'm sure most of us and uh, just kind of got to a point in my life where I knew coaching was something I wanted to do, but I wasn't sure what type of coaching I wasn't the greatest athlete. So making it to the highest levels of coaching without having played at the highest levels seemed to be difficult from a sport coach standpoint. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled into strength and conditioning. Honestly, it was kind of a stumbled into strength and conditioning story. From there, it looked like that was the opportunity for me to to kind of get to the higher levels of the sport where I really felt like I wanted to be. And I wasn't going to be there as a, a sport coach on the sidelines or anything like that, but potentially as a strength and conditioning, physical preparation specialist, there was an opportunity for me to get into some spaces that maybe I uh, wouldn't otherwise have had the credibility to kind of walk into. Yeah, for sure. And were you a volleyball guy growing up or did you just you know kind what? of find your way into the sport? Yeah, it, it found me. It okay. uh, Yeah, volleyball, uh, again, born and raised in Minnesota. Uh, boys, men don't play uh, volleyball there. There is no real avenue for the sport in, right. in Minnesota growing up. There may be now. It's been a number of years since I've lived there. But growing up, that was not the sport of choice. And so it actually has turned out to be quite the blessing to, to essentially start at this level with volleyball. I had some low-level experience with the sport, but nothing – that rivals anything close to where the the athletes I'm working with, the coaches I'm working with now. So the way I, I kind of explain it to people now is I, I jumped right into a PhD program of volleyball. I, <laughs> I've got to learn, I got to learn volleyball from w- without any preconceived understanding of the sport, really even to the basic rules, more or less the head coach of the women's national team. I'm sure if anyone's familiar with volleyball is Karch Karai. And that name rings a bell to most people uh, who, who understand the sport. And so now I just, I watch him run practices and I have for eight seasons. And so wow. you just, you, you can't help but absorb the sport from the people who know it and see it the best. And so, yeah, volleyball kind of found me and, and it's really, it's been fascinating. The women's game specifically is just as, as because it's my area of specialty. Now I just find myself completely engulfed in the sport and watching it and learning everything I can. And just the athleticism is ridiculous to see on a, on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. When I was doing my research and getting everything prepped for the show and I saw that Karch mm-hmm. Karai was the women's coach and you get to work with him. I was a little bit of a fanboy for a moment there. Cause I remember growing up watching him. I mean, an elite indoor career, then transitioned to beach crushed it sure. there. I mean, art, I don't even know if it's arguable, like arguably the best, men's volleyball player of all time, at least from the U.S. Certainly, yeah. He's actually won an award as the, the greatest male volleyball player in the last century or something like that. I think he shares <laughs> it with crazy. an Italian player or something like that. And right. he's just uh, as great of a volleyball player as he was. He's a next level human as well. And so That's you just awesome. can, can imagine learning the sport from somebody like that is just uh, consider myself very blessed to be able to experience it uh, with his assistance. It's yeah. great. That's awesome, man. Okay, yeah. so so fill in this gap for me though, because here you are, young kid growing up Minnesota, and then now you're working for USA women's volleyball at the highest level. Yeah. Connect those dots. Like, was there any in between there? Or what was your career path like? Yeah, no, great question. There's all sorts of in between there. It uh 
really it started off. I'm very fortunate. I found a mentor in strength conditioning basically on day one. I was one of those knucklehead kids that just stumbled into a, a sport training facility, not really sure what I was going to do. Basically off the advice of a professor in undergrad who said, you know, go see what these people do if you're interested in this performance world. And I stumbled into a space where uh, where Tim Polo was working, who is now working. He works with the USOPC. He's the men's volleyball strength conditioning coach, along with women's water polo. So he's got a whole nother uh, <laughs> portfolio of sports. Right. But him and I share an office. And it started one day stumbling into his, his facility in Minnesota. And I just grabbed onto those coattails as hard as I could. And uh, as he ascended in his career, I was able to, to kind of follow in his wake, which uh, – helped me get to places where I probably shouldn't have gotten just simply because he was such a uh, innovator and on the cutting edge of things and was able to kind of chart a path, uh, help me chart a path that really worked for me. So I spent a good number of years uh, in the Olympic movement, kind of under his tutelage, uh, some time at some tr various training centers, a, a stint with the NSCA through their assistantship program, uh, working with some strength conditioning coaches. And so uh, through a lot of help from Tim and some other mentors and people along the way, really kind of helped carve a path out for me that got me to Southern California uh, for grad school and from Southern California grad school, just volunteering a lot at various locations to try to gain that experience at that highest level. You know, yeah. they don't do GA positions for <laughs> national team athletes. Right. And I knew that was the space I wanted to be was, was Olympic caliber, not necessarily volleyball or maybe even team sports, but definitely the national team level was the area that I was most interested in. And so I knew I couldn't follow the traditional strength coach collegiate path to get there. Or if I was going to, it was going to take me a lot longer. So yep. some great mentors, right place, right time, right people, really a lot of help from others. Got yeah. me to where I'm at today. That's awesome, man. Okay. So I want to start with a question that I know I want the answer to, and I'm sure my listeners will be interested in as well. And so let's be really blunt here. Like how in the heck does your yeah. gig work? Because in say soccer or basketball, the athletes are attached to a club and they spend the bulk of their time with the club and they report to a national team camp for a couple of times a year. Is that how it works for you or is it a little bit different? It is a little bit different. It's close, uh, not too far off. I think the, the largest difference is in volleyball, the, the club season, the clubs in general just aren't as lucrative as maybe a soccer or basketball club. So most players only sign contracts roughly for about a year. Sometimes okay. you'll get a, a one plus one kind of deal. Yep. Uh, but what that really means for the purpose of this conversation is our players actually play just a club season for half the season. And then they come back to the States and join the national team for half of a year. And oh, so wow. okay. we're, we're not, they're not at a club for a year round with intermittent two week training blocks, one week training blocks, things like that. We actually get them for a season. It's usually the summer months uh, are the bulk of our, of our calendar. And so what that really means is I'm a strength coach. Uh, with a team from about April till October, and then they kind of disperse across the globe. And then it becomes a lot of consulting work and, and working with their strength conditioning coaches at their various clubs and things like that um, to help them try to stay on the path as we work towards every, any given Olympic season. So it is uh, a little unique compared to the soccer model where they end up staying with their clubs and right. they're just released for small periods of time. I'm fortunate to have more concentrated blocks of time. However, that does mean much like those soccer or potentially basketball players is their year round volleyball players, 11 ish months of competition, which is a, uh, wow. for anybody would sound like a lot, you know, we, <laughs> yeah. we, we kind of ballpark it that they get about two weeks off between club and national team season. So that gives you about a month of season. Off. They are maybe not at the behest of a club or us on the national team. So they're, their calendar, our players, they live a, a pretty unique lifestyle, and we're just here to try to help support them the best we can because it's uh, 11 months of volleyball, 11 months of anything is a long time. So those long careers can can really drain a person. Absolutely. Absolutely. So so how does that work in the sense that, like, and again, I'm, let's go back to like a, a soccer or basketball model. Like it's pretty mm -hmm. clear, like their rights belong to a club and they're kind of the mm -hmm. focus and you get to share them for four to six weeks mm. at a time throughout the year. You've got them six months out of the year. So how does that work as far as like managing an athlete or creating programs for an athlete? Like how does that mm -hmm. work? Great question. The NGB of USA Volleyball, the national governing body of USA Volleyball, releases players to their clubs. So in in the similar terms that you are using before, that they're 
kind of the the rights are held by a club. Yeah. The rights are actually held by the United States. The NGB oh, okay. here, and we sign off on transfers to send them uh, to their various clubs. And so, their clubs, depending on where they go, uh, volleyball is primarily popular. Women's volleyball is primarily popular in Southern Europe, right? Italy is a pretty yep. big women's uh, Turkey, and then. China, Japan, and Brazil are probably the top leagues in the world. So our players kind of scatter to the uh, to those locations in the fall and winter. And depending on where they go, we have various relationships, and they have various strength in their clauses with their with their clubs. So if they go to China, we actually have an opportunity to affect more change. They're, they have a little bit more freedom for us to kind of help them in their process. Japan a little bit more, but then when they start getting into the European uh, clubs, those clubs have a little bit more control over the players that come yeah. in. And so we have a less influence with the players who go to Italy and Turkey and similarly Brazil. So it, uh, it just kind of depends on where they end up. And really what it's, it's forced me to do as a, as a practitioner is to really reach out to these European strength conditioning staffs, these, these people who are out there that essentially we become their performance team. And yeah. they, those, those professionals generally stay around their club for a number of years. And if they, maybe they move, they move to a, a club where potentially we've already had some players in the past. So over the last number of years, you really start to develop relationships with these people. And it just helps with the, the collaboration around this athlete is, you know, we keep this athlete center. It's to both the club and the national team's best interest to, to keep this player healthy and keep them going and keep them on the path. And so because of that, the mutual interest in the player's health and well-being, there's such a great world out there when you really get out there and talk to these these professionals um, you know language can be a little bit of a barrier sure. i speak no other languages so this is not <laughs> this is this is simply from a place of ignorance uh english has been has is fortunate that it's a popular enough language across the world where i'm able to communicate with a lot of these people in italy and turkey and, and china and japan to some degree as well and so just a big team it's all one big yeah, team i love it man so as we kind of talked before the show i grew up around volleyball and the the little city that I grew up in had like perennial state champions like every year. But I also realized that not everyone was entrenched in the sport like I was early on. So with that being said, could you talk to me a little bit about the game and what physical mm. qualities are necessary to compete at the highest levels? Yeah. So the way I think about volleyball players, especially at this level, you know, think about a basketball body. But now think about the speed at which their arms have to move to 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 play the sport. So in basketball, yeah. they're big bodies, but any one action, while quick and explosive, is not quite as quick and explosive as an attacker attacking the volleyball. Like maybe yeah. a, a breakaway dunk, something like that, where someone's really trying to hammer home the rim, right? Like right. bring that thing down, like Shaquille O'Neal. Right. You'll you'll maybe see some players who do things like that. But in a volleyball match, we have players who will just the acceleration in short bursts becomes such a, a huge part of the game. And where I go with that is that really comes down to the physical quality of a power to weight ratio. We really have decided and, and learned through the, the use of some sport technology and things like that, that power to weight ratio is such a, an important variable for us simply for the reasons we would all understand it to be, you know, how powerful are you per unit of body mass? You can't have body mass. That's not helpful to, power production right in this sport it's 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 a relative uh, strength sport you, you the jumping and landing the acceleration the deceleration if you are if you are not in the right composition to handle the 11 months of the season you're going to break down and the the sport is pretty much characterized by overuse injuries you know yeah. ankles knees uh, hips backs and shoulders are pretty much your your locations that you're looking out for and it's it's mainly overuse you know you have your your knee injuries that that happen and, and you know ankle sprains and things like that but power to weight ratio becomes a pretty big focus especially early in in the quad is what we call it every four year cycle yeah we really try to hone that process in and if you're not already feeling really good about your power to weight ratios and your body composition that's that becomes kind of the first low-hanging fruit that we go after over time as we've as I've been with the program and players have played multiple seasons in multiple quads, we start to, to become much more specific through some of the measurements and sport technology that we do. We try to learn kind of where players tend to fall their ranges of, of various, uh, various measurements, simple things, you know, we put them on a force plate and get concentric rate of force developments and, you know, eccentric braking and things like that concentric impulse, all these, you know, these new terms that everyone, now that everyone has force plates in their gyms, right. they're, we're all, we're all learning a lot more about this sport technology. I never had one until a number of years back. And so we're just in the process now of learning what physical jump qualities are 
uh, for our players. Again, we don't get them for as much time as we'd like. Who does? Right. Um, and so the measurement of that is we're just now getting the data, enough data to feel like the trends we were seeing are taking hold and we can start to uh, individualize our programs to better suit our players. But yeah, power to weight ratio becomes a big deal. It's really a, it's a play re- recover repeat kind of sport and it, yep. it comes at you quick here for sure. Well, like you said, any sport that you have to play 11 months out of the year yeah. is, is going to be intensive. And like you said, a lot of overuse stuff, like mm-hmm. one thing that, that I always thought of, cause I played volleyball and then I worked with our volleyball players for a handful of years, both when I was at ball state and when I was at a, a local high school And the way I kind of think of it is you need that first step forward, backward, side to side of a basketball player. You need the vertical power of a basketball player, but then you've got like the shoulder and arm of a pitcher. So it's kind of a unique blend. So I think it helps to have some of that, you know, like baseball, they get so caught up rightfully so in shoulder stuff, but you Mm -hmm. need some of that knowledge, but you need that, like you talked about that power to weight ratio is so critical and that's why you don't see many overweight volleyball players right like some of those guys can get away with it in basketball you cannot get away with it in volleyball that's a that's a great point the way i think about volleyball specifically too where it differs from a lot of other sports is a lot of that torque happens in the air where there's no ground reaction forces any longer right so you're you know lauren land you know i'm sure your audience is familiar with him has that saying where he says you know leverage your levers about your center of mass and that's kind of how i how you know the biomechanics of the body work but now do that in midair right. and leverage your levers about your center mass do that in midair where your center mass is moving and you know you're having to torque around your spine and your hips and things like that and the shoulder bears the brunt of a lot of it and so you know a pitcher at least they have the ground to push off on you know throughout the range of motion of releasing a ball yep. these players jump off the ground and then they make contact with a ball in midair that's traveling you know maybe perpendicular to where they're trying to go so there's an impact with the ball that happens that doesn't happen with uh, with baseball you know even tennis players they they get the ground a little bit more than a volleyball right. player and obviously their lever lengthens when they add a racket but that ball is much smaller and it's just a very different beast but yeah the ground not having the ground available and still having to whip that arm around uh, over your body is is a really explosive and powerful movement. You just can't afford to not have either force producing or force absorbing tissue kind of ready to go and, yes. and, and able to withstand uh, what you got going on there. That's awesome, man. Times 11 months out of the year. <laughs> Times 11 months out of the year. Exactly right. <laughs> so talk to me about, about developing versus managing your athletes. And this is something yeah. I'm so fascinated by because... You know, I've worked at every level. I've worked with like the little middle and high school age kids. I've worked with D1. I've, you know, worked with the highest level basketball, soccer type players. So everyone you come in contact with is already at a high level, right? You're not Mm -hmm. taking little Johnny or or little Susie who's 12 and trying to build her up. So Mm -hmm. with that being said, how much time do you spend on developing physical qualities versus simply trying to maintain them and keep them healthy? Yeah, no, that's a super, super great question. Very, very insightful. One of the first things I'll tell our players when they arrive is if you're in our gym, you jump high enough already. Your your physical jump qualities are high enough that you're in our facility. Very rarely is there an athlete where an inch, two inches, three inches are going to make the difference in their ability to play the sport any longer. Their biggest challenge when they arrive to us is especially on the women's side, not a problem on the men's side. And this is, has to do with NCAA rules, which is a, a podcast for another day, <laughs> but uh, they, they have to kind of learn how to play international rules. And so what okay. that means is uh, there are, there are players in college who don't play all six rotations. Whereas in the international world, you have to play all six rotations. So there's a, really? a huge learning curve for various position groups that need to start to do things for the, really the first time, in their entire volleyball careers where they have to put an emphasis on serving defense and things like that. Whereas before they would just substitute a player out, a a college girl would come running in, run across the back row, pass and play defense. And they get back to the front row. Here comes the next player again. And so to your question, the development side of things is really done in the first three years of the quad. And I, I talk about identification and development. We, we identify and try to develop various qualities about the athlete that we either have deemed deficient, meaning we, we have an understanding that they're important. And now we're going to try to build them up in some way, or where we understand that there's a connection between the skill that may not be very good at yet and the skill that makes them really elite. And if we can maybe raise the one that they're deficient in, potentially that could help assist the, the skills that they're already really good at. And so we use about the first three years of the quad to kind of feel that process out and understand 
kind of where we can push, where we can't. It's a lot of trial and error, especially the younger players. We're really trying to understand, uh, you know, they're trying to tread water the first year or so. As like I said, they're trying right. to just figure out this new sport. They start playing year round. They go overseas. They're away from friends and family. It's a lot. Of, it's a lot for them to manage. So we try sure. to be really respectful of that process with them. And so as they get a little bit more advanced in their career, they're, they're in year four, maybe the Olympic year, or maybe they're in their second or third Olympic quad. We've got a pretty solid idea of what these athletes need. And it just becomes a lot of uh, checking in on those processes to make sure that we're still honing in on the things we really like to hone in on. But we do spend a significant portion of our training blocks around support movements, right? So reciprocal training, right? It's a pressing sport. So we do a lot more pulling right. and uh, you know, they do a lot of jumping. So we don't do a lot of jumping. And that actually right. ends up being one of those things that takes a long time for the players to get comfortable with. Again, it's like a splash of cold water. When you come to our <laughs> gym, they've, they've been playing volleyball. They've been elite. They're fantastic, but now you have to do it a little bit differently. You have to do it for year round. You have to do it away from your friends and family. And so yeah. trying to get them to kind of change the thought process around, you know, bigger, faster, stronger into durable, de- adaptable, and robust is really a, a, a big switch for a lot of volleyball players. Cause for so long, it's all about jump higher, be faster, be more explosive. And at some point, if you're in our gym, we feel like those boxes are checked. And now it's like, can you do this day in, day out, month in, month out, year in and year out? And it's the consistency that really we try to help these athletes find. And that's both with their their court work, but definitely in their, their strength conditioning and their physical preparation. Yeah, that's fascinating. Okay, so first off, I never knew that about the international game because mm-hmm. I'm so used to watching, especially now, like I felt like the Libero came in more like when I was in college. So Mm -hmm. it's really interesting to hear that because you do, you see these huge girls that go in in front row and they never serve. They never have to play in the back row. So Mm -hmm. I'm assuming is that kind of the thought process you guys have? Obviously you can take somebody that's tall and athletic and can jump and you can convert them to the back, but you can't go the other way, right? Like if they're touching like nine, six, you don't get to hit. Sorry. Like I don't care how good you are. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's super interesting to see. And and I think the other side of it is just, just to paint the picture even further is the best player on our team, world-class volleyball player. And she knows this, so I'm not telling her if she was listening, she wouldn't, she wouldn't know, she'd know who I'm talking about, not the best jumper in the gym. And it's not even really that close. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just an example of at this point, you know, the best jumper I have ever tested in our gym, never touched the court for us. Yeah. You know, the, the highest absolute jump tight jump height some marginal, what we would consider development tournaments. They would maybe go to those ones, but senior level, international high quality volleyball, the the best jumpers on our program just generally do not have the volleyball skills to allow them to play at this level, given they've been pretty much just front row players most of their career. Right. And at this level, you get six substitutions and you can't afford to be sub and offensive players out for defensive players in the back row. That's just not a, that's a technical tactical strategy that I had to learn, you know, as a young strength coach coming in, you just, you assume it's all about, you know, over the block, right. Just hit it over the block. Let's get them. Let's jump them higher. Let's jump them faster. That'd be nice. That's just not the case. Yeah. That's just not the case. Okay. So one more follow-up question on this thread, Mm -hmm. your girl, that's not the best jumper, but she's the best player. What makes her the best? Yeah. Well, there's a lot that makes her the best. I'll stick to the the scope of uh, of our of our uh, podcast here and say what makes her the best is her consistency. She is uh, as strength coaches, we all understand that it's really about the consistency, the, the consistent nature of training of doing anything is really how you gain adaptation. And really, what we try to help our players do is avoid the, the big swings, the big highs, and the yeah. and the low lows, and try to find a level of consistency. And the thing that she does above anyone else, in my opinion, is when it's time to work, it's work time and it's consistent effort and intensity focus. And that skill set that she's developed, I had had no role to play at that point. <laughs> this is all her. Uh, she's, she's a rock star in that way. Comes to the gym, ready to put in the work and stays super, super consistent in her training. Trust that process uh, and understands as she's gotten older that, you know, the things that got you here are no longer really going to keep you here. If you want to stay and continue to do better things, you kind of have to do things a little bit differently. Yep. And we talk a lot about, especially as they get a little older, just how much more uh, important the recovery side of things are. You know, your the recovery is wasted on those young players. They just don't, they don't need to recover as actively as maybe an older right. player. They just show up every day, ready to play, you know, a right. couple, a couple squats and a few twists and a couple <laughs> warm up swings and they're ready to go. And that's just not the case when you hit the 
the later ages. And so her consistency is what sets her apart. Her, uh, her mentality around consistency is important. That's awesome, man. Okay. So this actually leads me seamlessly into kind of my final question, which is all about training the aging athlete. And sure. I feel like across the board, you can talk basketball, you can talk baseball, you can talk soccer. You're seeing these athletes trend older as they understand this recovery process better. Mm -hmm. So kind of a two-parter here. Number one, are you seeing the same thing in volleyball? And number two, if so, what would you attribute that success to? What are they doing differently now versus in the past? Great question. Um, yes, I, I do think so. I haven't looked lately at the average age of our team right now. Uh, we do have a few players that are going into their third Olympic cycle. They're trying to make their third Olympic games. Yeah. Uh, one of them is trying to do it as a first time mother. And so wow. that's a pretty rare thing on team sports to see, yeah. especially international volleyball in a, in a sport that doesn't have a pro league in the States. You know, she has to go play overseas and, and continue to be a mother uh, while doing that. And so absolutely the, the older, the player, we are seeing some older players. Now we do, we do have some, some drop off as most do, we're, I think we're, we're probably pretty close to the extremes. We have a lot of really young players and then some of the ones that have been uh, through the ringer a few times, um, not so many in the middle. And so what do I attribute a lot of that to, you know, what we're doing differently is what I said before on steroids, we, we've gone to the durable, adaptable, robust model pretty yep. heavily with these players. So the explosive, you know, rate of force development type of you know, platform style, RFD type of training that were that that probably they did a lot of when they were in college is not really the emphasis for us any longer. We we really try to help their tissues yeah. handle the training. So we do some pretty heavy uh, strength training in periods of time when we can do that, focusing a lot on their range of motion and then really, you know, truthfully it I say this and we, everybody says it is that recovery piece is super important, but it really becomes when they make the transition to this idea that they're a 24 seven athlete and, you yeah. know, it's your nutrition, it's your sleep. It's, you know, we're based in Southern California and price of living is expensive out here. And so some players like to live a little bit further away from our facility because the cost of living might be cheaper out in those areas. And so they have a commute. And so some players are willing to to short, to pay a little bit more to live a little closer so they could be closer to the facility. And I right. think it's those type of veteran moves that uh, you start to see from players. So that way they can be in the facility longer. They don't feel like they're stuck here all day. They can take care of their bodies and feel like this is really the, the job that they're here for. So it's a, it's a two pronged thing. We, we definitely, we put an emphasis on strength training, actually getting stronger, preparing the tissues for the 11 months of volleyball. But then on the other side of it is the education around recovery. And, and it's more than just go rest or go stretch or go foam roll. It's the, it's the whole gamut of nutrition and sleep and the, your mental game and all those kind of things as well. And so the, as they learn that process and appreciate further that what got them here is not going to keep them here. Uh, you can see those players start to make the leap into seasoned grizzly vets. And uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're a force to be reckoned with when they have the IQ and the, and the reps built up at that yeah. point, and they can still play the game at a high level. Yep. Uh, man, it, it, uh, it actually kind of gives me chills to, to think about uh, watching some of these players do their, do their thing um, as they continue through their career. It's, it's fun. That's awesome, man. Okay, one more question. So <laughs> what does a typical day look like, like start to finish? You talked about being in the facility all day, and I know mm. every pro team is different, right? Like so a lot of my basketball guys – or, or gals, if they play in Europe, it's like mm -hmm. two a days, like all year game on Saturday versus, you know, a lot of NBA guys, man, you go in and maybe you lift and you do a, a walkthrough or a shoot around, you go home. What does your mm -hmm. day look like? Yeah, that's a super great question that, uh, our coaching staff, our, our group of coaches, the people who make up the women's national team coaches and support staff, we put a really strong emphasis on our players, like whole person well-being. Yeah. And what that means and why that's important for this is our players spend six or so months away from friends and family. They're overseas. They're, they're living in places that they otherwise probably wouldn't live in. And so when they come back to the States, we have built a calendar around essentially the minimum effective dose, right? It's <laughs> it, we, we give them Saturdays and Sundays off more nice. often than not. There are a few opportunities or a few times when maybe a training block wouldn't allow for that. But the vast majority of the time they don't train on Saturdays and Sundays. 
Uh, and that's done intentionally to give them an opportunity. They, they're not from Southern California. Very few of them are. So they, right. they take the opportunity to go home and spend time with family and friends. Now, this is all pre-COVID stuff, but sure. um, who knows what will happen this <laughs> summer. But they, they get an opportunity to kind of refill those buckets. And so our training day is essentially a Monday through Friday schedule. And for the players, it usually starts around 8 o'clock in the morning with you know about 45 minutes of you know prep work that they like to do individualized prep work that we've helped them kind of identify and they work on and then they go into meetings for a little bit and then we generally have a, a strength training session for half the team our facility uh is big enough our strength conditioning facility is big enough to handle about half of our roster at any given time effectively so we have a group that'll train right before practice for about 90 minutes or so and then they they go practice for two two and a half hours pretty consistently and then that second group will come into the weight room and we'll get a lift in with that group. And then after that, it's it's player specific meetings with coaches, you know, meal times, recovery times, massage, chiros, things like that. And so that's a pretty loose interpretation of Monday through yeah. Friday. But uh, we're mindful of the fact that the work that they put in is is amplified if they can fill up some other buckets in their life. And unfortunately, that falls to us on the national team because they don't have a national, there's no league here for them to play in. So they're almost right. all overseas dealing with the adversity of living in a new country with a new language, you know, potentially with uh, sport coaches who they can communicate with or not communicate with. And right. so there's, there's a lot that that can kind of put uh, stresses on their lives. And we try really hard to balance those things out when we can. And knowing that we have jobs to do here too, right? We, we want to succeed. We want, we want to win gold medals and trophies and things like that too. Right. So we have a job and, and not in a, in a, it's really a mandate to, to kind of bring home gold medals. You know, that's, yeah. that's we're USA and that's, that's what we do. You know, gold medals is, is, is our currency. So uh, that's a, that's a pretty, uh, pretty consistent schedule for us. That's awesome, man. Great answer. Okay. Big question time, my guy, if you sure. could alter the space time continuum and give young Jimmy Stitz one piece of advice, what would it be? Awesome. You know what? I think it would be learning the power of no, honestly, I think the, the, the freedom that it has given me to stop trying to please everyone by saying yes to everything and getting into projects and things that just stretch you out. And, you know, you get halfway through it and you realize like, what am I even doing here? I don't, why did I, why are we doing this? I, I don't know if I fully understood this when I said yes. Right. And really why I think that's important is it's allowed me to get much more granular on the things that do matter by saying no to some things that maybe I want to do, or I'm interested in, or potentially have some value that maybe I'm not seeing yet. But by being better with my time management, by saying no to things has been hugely valuable to me. And it's, I used to think time management was just show up on time to whatever <laughs> you had, right? Like that was time management right. to me. It was just don't be late. And so I'm not late. That's not a thing that I am. But once you realize that it's much deeper than just show up on time for work, and it's really about blocking off times for focused work, concentration, you know, opportunities to really get into things without lots of distractions around you and, and you know, we all want to help. I think that that's the thing about the, the staff that I work with is we're, we're all cut from the same cloth. We all want to help each other do lots of different things. Uh, but the reality is too, that we're a, we're a skeleton crew. We're not as big as a professional organization with three athletic trainers and, you know, two or three strength coaches. It's, there's pretty much one of everything here. And right. so that, that forces us to, uh, that forces us to be really diligent and really understand what we're going to put our time towards. Because if you're, if you're stretched out or maybe down the rabbit hole of something that's not useful and you can't get yourself back out of it, potentially you're missing so many more opportunities. So if I could go back and, and tell myself anything, it'd just be more intentional with the use of, of the word yes, but also with the word no. Yeah, I love that, man. Great advice. Okay, last but not least, we've got our lightning round. So four fairly yeah. short questions. Your answers can be as long or short as you like. All right? Right on. Number one, what's your career highlight so far as a coach? You know what? I got into this uh, profession to go to Olympic games. And I would say going to the Rio 2016 Olympics has to be the, the, the taking the cake. That's going is, is a highlight watching our team lose in the semifinals and then come back and win a bronze in the Olympic games. Just got chills thinking about that too. Yeah. Um, to team sports. I've said this from the time I was really little. I remember thinking this and my friends kind of laughed at me, you know, in team sports, you, uh, a silver medal is not quite the same as a silver medal in individual sports. You, you lose your way into a silver medal in, in team sports, you win a bronze medal. And I think that that mentality to watch our team win a bronze medal um, is absolutely the highlight of my career at this point, winning that bronze medal and being a part of that team and that program at that point was, 
uh, something I'll never forget. And those people are people I'll never forget. That's awesome, man. Okay. Number two, I don't know if this is really applicable, so I might have to change it, but mm. who was your favorite volleyball player growing up? You weren't really around oh, you, the sport or you can yeah, say now, no. whatever works. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's a great question. I, uh, I joked with the, the head coach of our team, Karch Karai, a few times that I didn't even know who he was when I started working <laughs> for the program. And that's saying something. Cause he is the, he's the goat. He's the Michael Jordan. Yeah. He's the goat. He, everybody knows who he is. So I don't have one from childhood. I will say, uh, in my time, since I've been with the program, I can say this cause I don't work with our men's program. I only work with our women's clay. Stanley was a man amongst boys to watch that guy play volleyball just a special, special athlete, special, special person just out there doing some great things. And I got a chance to work with him later in his career when he was kind of coming back from some things and just, uh, yeah, a lot of admiration for Clay Stanley. Awesome, man. All right. Uh, number three, what's the highest touch you've ever recorded? And maybe along those same lines, cause they're not always the same. What was the mm-hmm. highest vertical jump you ever saw? 11, three, uh, for a woman, uh, oh I believe God. if, if I'm remembering correctly, I was only a, an observer to the men's teams testing. I believe it was 12, two, if I'm remembering correctly, it was 12 in some change was, uh, watching one of the men's players touch 12, one, 12, two, something like that. But I will, will never forget the day I watched this woman walk into our gym on day one testing day and go and touch 11, three. I've That's just never ridiculous. seen, I've never seen 11. The highest I'd seen prior to 11, three was 10, I think if I'm remembering correctly. So yeah, yeah, 11, three, that's a, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother beast of volleyball right there. And then the, the displacement, if I'm remembering correctly, was somewhere in like the 37 ish, 38. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, again, uh, different athletes. Um, thankfully, you know, they spread some of that athleticism around. (laughs) You can't, can't can't all hoard it with one athlete. That's right. That's awesome, man. Okay. Last but not least, number four, What's next for Jimmy Stitz? Yeah, you know what? We're pretty singularly focused on Tokyo 2020 slash 21. You know, that that wrench that got thrown in, you know, I think was a blessing in disguise for our program for a lot of reasons. Now here we are getting geared up for the Olympic Games. So I would say that's what's next. We have a we have one tune up tournament that's we leave for in nine weeks and we'll build our Olympic team based off of a lot of those results of that tournament. And then it's all about Japan and Tokyo and trying to uh, improve off that bronze medal. And after that, you know, who knows what the, what the future holds. USA volleyball's got some really exciting things happening here. We've, we've really put a lot of emphasis in our national team development program. It's been rebranded, rethought out there. The pipeline that that gets players into our gym where I would see them on a regular basis has, is being, I would characterize it as upgraded. And uh, I'm excited to see what that means for us uh, as an organization, uh, not just next season, but into future quads as well. So who knows what the future holds, but yeah. Tokyo 2021, here we come and uh, we're going for that gold medal. I love it, man. Well, we'll be cheering for you. Lots of good stuff. Sounds like you've been awesome, man. So great to catch up with you. Where can my listeners find out more about you and all the great work you're doing? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm probably a little harder to find than most. Uh, I'm not a big social media guy. I'm a LinkedIn probably is the okay. most social media of anything that you'll find me on. And then I'm, you know, my email, we could put in the show notes or something like that. I'm an open book for when it comes to email. Uh, I, I love corresponding that way. And then nowadays with Zoom, you know, it's been yeah. a lot of fun to to connect with coaches who I just otherwise, you know, maybe jump on a phone call or wouldn't otherwise get a chance to meet. So uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an open book, but I'm just, I'm just not a social media open book. If yeah. you let's, let's have some conversation. Let's, let's do some talking, but, uh, you're not going to find me, uh, on the, on Twitter or Facebook or anything like that. Instagram, definitely not. So <laughs> that's totally good, man. I love it. You focused, focused. Yeah, right on. Yeah, well, Jim, absolutely. Jimmy again, man. Thanks so much for coming on, man. This is really great. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. This is, uh, it's been fun. And that does it for this week's show with Jimmy. Sincerely hope you enjoyed it. He's a guy that I'd never connected with in the past, but absolutely just hit it off with him right away. Love talking shop. You can obviously tell I'm a pretty big nerd when it comes to volleyball, growing up playing the sport. Uh, So it was fun to just sit and rap with another volleyball guy, learn about what they're doing. And man, this guy is doing it at the highest level. So really enjoyed the show. Hope you did as well. If you did, I got one small favor to ask. We absolutely crushed it last week with Joel's show. I mean, like our day one downloads were like 50% higher than usual. Now granted, part of that is the fact that it is the Joel Jameson, but man, I would love to put guys like Jimmy at the forefront. He's not on social like a lot of these guys are, but 
Man, if you enjoyed this show, please do me a favor and share this with somebody that would benefit from it. They don't have to be in volleyball. This could be any trainer, any coach, any rehab professional that could learn something from Jimmy and something from our discussion. If you could pass it along to them, I would truly appreciate it. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back soon with our next episode. Take care.